Hello, this is Adam Klein, Global Graduate Director and Faculty Member at New Ventures West. Welcome to Episode 6 of Stepping In, a podcast where we delve into how integral coaching can address some of the most pressing issues we face as individuals, as communities, and stewards of our planet. Today we are exploring busyness and its effect on our connection to ourselves and others. I was joined by Creative Communications Director Joy Reichart and special guest Catherine O'Sullivan. Catherine is the graduate of the professional coaching course, has lived and worked in five countries, and currently lives in the Bay Area. She's an internal coach and leadership and development consultant at Google. In this episode, we look at this phenomenon of busyness. Have you ever found yourself when asked how you are responding busy or I'm busy? Well, we start the conversation looking at what's going on in our culture that has this be the case. I think in our culture, it's, it's a habit to say I'm busy, right? <laughs> it seems to be the standard answer to the question of how we are. And I guess on a surface level, it means I have a lot to do. But what does it really mean? What are we really saying? And I, I mean, obviously, it depends on the individual, but it could be, you know, I'm so busy because I'm so important. Right. Or maybe I'm busy, don't ask me how I'm really doing, right? It's, it's like putting up a wall nearly. And I, I really think it's, a lot of it has to do with how complex our lives are these days. You know, it just seems like being busy is nearly like a strategy to, to cope with the complexity of modern life. But of course, it's an illusion, right? It's, right. it's not achieving. It's not right. achieving real relief from the demands that, that life is, is giving us. Right. And one of the reasons, uh, Catherine, that you came to mind and why I wanted to invite you into this conversation was I have this hypothesis that some of it feels like um, a bleed over from like a corporate culture where we're busy because of all of the, the demands and things that we need to get done and accomplish. And then that, our, per, our work life, and our way of being in the work life, so how we are there, spills over into our personal life. So we're busy at work because there's too many things to do. And we don't, and we have this way of, well, I can't connect with you. I can't talk to you because I have to get my work done. And then how that bleeds over into just our friendships and what we're also up to in life. Yeah. So it's an interesting question. I, I mean, there's definitely something around, identifying with performance and identifying with results, which I'm sure spills over from the corporate world, but I think it starts way earlier than that. I think it starts in school, right? I mean, even our kids are busy. So I think it's a narrative that if we're producing, we're worthy, right? Or if we're producing, we're safe. Or if we're producing, we belong. So what do you think um, the effect is on our sense of ourselves, our, the sense of who we are as human beings because of this? I think, I mean, it depends, right? If you look at busyness on a continuum, it could be anything from I'm, I'm busy because I'm taking on all these exciting projects and I'm really loving what I'm doing and it's actually more energizing to the other end of the continuum where I'm totally overwhelmed, right? And and it's just really taking a toll on my life. It's hard on my nervous system. Um, you know, I think burnout is a really good example mm -hmm. where if you're asking how it affects us, you know, when it's on the, on, the, on the scale of complete overwhelm, I think it can actually be really detrimental uh, to our health. And if, if I look at relationships, busyness doesn't allow us to connect. Right. I mean, it's if we constantly have to rush from A to B or manage our time or prioritize who we interact with, how are we supposed to have really deep, meaningful connections? Right. And I think it gets to a point, right, where it leaves us wondering, what am I doing all this for? Um, why am I working so hard? Why am I running around so fast? Especially, you know, when, when, when you get to a, to, a, to a place where after a period of hard work and extreme busyness, you don't get the results you wanted or you expected. And I, I know that from myself, right? Then oftentimes 
it feels like we're crashing and burning and, and everything becomes meaningless. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's really, really sad in a way that we're, we're running so hard with the, you know, with the goal to have a better life. But the effect is that it's actually really, or can be really empty and meaningless. Right. What's your sense, Joy? Yeah, Catherine, what you were saying about um, busyness keeping us from really deeply connecting, it can also, does also keep us from really deeply feeling. And I've, I've noticed, I've observed folks, myself included, using busyness as an excuse or a band-aid for, you know, really being in deep feelings. Like I have, um, I know a couple of people close to me recently who have um, had losses and are in grief. And I've known people in the past where a big loss happens and you ask how they're doing and they say, oh, keeping busy and um, are encouraged around that. You know, like, oh, that's good. Keep them busy so that you don't need to really sit and be in um, those really strong, painful emotions. So, you know, it's, you know, it can, it can be used as um, it's a place that we go rather to um, perhaps where we need to be to really process our experience. Yeah, that reminds me of... Um when I went through the um, New Ventures West uh, professional coaching course, my, we have what's called a question for the year. And my question for the year that I was given was, where is the stillness right now? Mm. Which I've been, I've been in, you know, working with this question ever since. And that's like four or five years um, ago. <laughs> and what I've noticed, you know, uh, Joy, you've talked about feeling your feelings. When you are actually making time to be with the feelings and you feel the feelings rather than keeping busy, mm -hmm. you get such a release, a release. I mean, it takes a while. It's not easy to stay with the feelings and it, it requires building a capacity to be able to do that. But, but once you engage in that more and more, the release that comes with it is amazing and it's incredibly healing. And having gone through this powerful experience myself, you know, I'm, I'm making space with my coaching client for that as well. And it's, it's really been incredible mm. to see, to see the, you know, even what can happen in one session, even in terms of how people look when they come in and, and when they leave, you can, it nearly looks like a burden has fallen off their shoulders. It's so beautiful. I'd be curious to hear from you about yeah. this question of sitting with this question of, that you just spoke to, like, where is the stillness and how being with that question has changed the way that your life feels to you and that your work feels to you. And given that maybe it hasn't changed that much circumstantially, but how it feels has changed a lot. Can you say, can you say something about that? Yes. I mean, it's, you get more of a, uh, maybe guidance is a good word. You get more guidance in terms of what's the meaningful stuff to engage in and what's the small stuff that I maybe don't always have to sweat. It's helped me both internally and externally to make some changes. So externally, it's really helped me set better boundaries and prioritize. I, like one concrete example is I used to spend two and a half hours commuting every day because I identified myself with being the city girl and I had to commute down to the suburbs. But once I questioned that narrative and I actually moved to the suburbs and I realized I can actually survive in the suburbs and hey, I can be happy <laughs> in the <laughs> suburbs. I, you know, I, I, I had two, two and a half hours of my day back every day, mm. which is pretty amazing. And, and other little things, right. Um, in, in terms of, um, what what needs to what what do I need to tend to, Im, to to tend to immediately and what can wait and how much time do I actually spend on social media you know that I really don't need to spend etc. You know everybody has their own thing that we're using to numb ourselves out. So that's kind of more the external changes that I've made um, internally. I just, I feel like I'm more in, more in 
in line with how I want to design my life or what I want the organizing principles of my life to be. Mm. And also knowing, you know, that it's, you know, maybe if you look at it as a polarity, you know, there's what I want. And then there's also what do I discover where life is actually guiding me and where life is taking me. Mm. And, and just working with that polarity has given me a lot more fluidity rather mm. than my rigid kind of goal oriented, let's go for it, which has really caused a lot of suffering. And how is this showing up in the workplace for you? So, I mean, I won't lie, like I still get days where I feel completely overwhelmed and I get triggered. Um, but generally, work feels more meaningful to me now. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more courageous in terms of the kinds of conversations that I'm having. The feedback that I'm getting from others is th that they perceive me as very honest and very direct and also that they appreciate my presence, you know, which makes me really, really, really touches me because ultimately, you know, I think one of, the, we, we always talk about transformational leadership. And I think one of the things that really transforms the world is not so much what we do, but it's really first, first, first and foremost, who we are and how we show up. And I'm not saying that I have it all figured out, you know, <laughs> um, but I've, I definitely, you know, looking back on the past four years, like New Ventures West has really put me on a journey to live a, a more meaningful life, to live a, a life of more fluidity and more ease, you know, to just feel like I'm co contributing more and I'm not just pushing my own agenda. Right. Well, and I think you spoke to something important about all of this is it's not that we don't continue to get triggered or feel like, oh my gosh, I have so many things that I need to get done. And I've overcommitted myself that those feelings still come, but we have a way of coming back to center or coming back to ourselves and being like, okay, yes, all of this is happening and I'm not going to lose myself in it like I used to. Yeah. And I, I really feel like, or I've, you know, I've, I know from experience, it takes a little bit of time to build that capacity, but it's not, it's, it's totally doable. Like even within a super busy life, um, building in some practices mm -hmm. that help, you know, create some space mm -hmm. to, to connect to self and, and others, mm -hmm. or even just to become more aware. Mm -hmm. It's something that is like really, really pays off. And I think that's where the, you know, the, the coaching client relationship is, is so meaningful, you know, to, to, to identify what could those practices, what could those practices be? And then how, how am I integrating those in my life? And then using the coach as a, as an accountability partner, as a support system. It, it's really hard to do this by yourself. So there's definitely um, a lot of value in, in you know, having a, a partner or having a community to, to keep you honest. And that the payoff is huge. And once there is, a, a, you know, once there is like stillness or emptiness, all of a sudden, it's like magic. It kind of flips around and all these great things happen, but they happen with a lot more ease. Um, it's really hard to describe, um, <laughs> but it, it's like, it's like sw swimming against the stream, right? By trying to control and do the dishes and do the emails and do everything, you know, at the set deadline. That, and, and it feels like a constant struggle. And then it's like, okay, let go of that struggle, jump in the river. And then all of a sudden you go with the stream and you, you still do the stuff that you need to do somehow and it feels easier. But right. I think the fear of creating that emptiness or the fear of jumping in the river is what stops us from getting to that stage. And I think that's where the practices are so helpful because it's a gradual build up so it doesn't feel like this big shock 
I have to let everything go now. It's more like, you know, I'm, I'm slowly walking towards, you know, the edge and, and I'm realizing it's actually not as scary because I'm building all this support into my life by doing these practices. So I have a question for, for all of us, which is, what do we mean when we say create space? Mm-hmm. Your turn, Joy. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting to me after you asked that question, I think for a moment we did it. We created space. There was this um, pause that was you know, probably longer than is conducive for a podcast, but um, I feel like when there are those moments in life, again, at least in this culture of busyness, we feel very compelled to fill those in. So increasing our capacity for being with silence, space, pauses. Yeah, something to, to develop a relationship with. And there's also um, one of the practices I have, which is Aikido and the, um, the commitment that needs to be made, at least in the way I practice in my dojo, is making, um, making space in one's life for it. And I find often new students struggling with their job, their life, their kids, their commitments being the thing that is holy and immovable. And what people need to do and learn a lot is have that become more fluid so that they can make space for their commitments, you know, having that become less of an immovable truth so that they can move, move their lives around in order to fit in this practice that they need so much. So uh, I guess those are my thoughts on making space. Fantastic. To me, it means it's, it's like an exhale. I don't know. It feels like, letting it all out like with one breath even uh, it's it's dropping the burden that i'm carrying around um it's um connecting to that place inside me that feels resourceful and whole and and how do i do that um i mean over the years i've i've adopted different practices um but initially even just doing I like one minute of deep breathing every hour at work has already helped me. Mm. Right now, um, the newest practice that I've adopted, and I've been doing this for about two months, um, I've, been a star, uh, I've been doing uh, Qigong before my meditation every morning. And it's been really interesting because I really hated it in the beginning. I I thought it was slow. I thought it was a waste of time. I felt like I already have a yoga practice. Why do I need this? And I really resisted it. But I know, you know, I've, one thing I've learned in my life is when I resist something, that's where I need to go. <laughs> that's where I learned to need to be present. Wow. So I learned to be present with the resistance. And as as that happened, it kind of melted away and I really got into it and I really learned to be present. Say a little bit more about resistance because I think this is a fantastic and overlooked thing about human beings where we feel resistance and so we interpret it as, oh, it must not be good for me. I don't like it, so I'll do something else. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) It's you know, once something initially doesn't feel good, I think we just, you know, as human beings, we just don't want to go there. It doesn't feel good. Therefore, let's avoid it or let's Mm -hmm. resist it and let's try to change it. I think that's kind of also at the core of busyness, right? Let's be busy to change whatever it is that we don't like at this point in time, whatever that is. And again, Engaging with the resistance, right? Trying to make the resistance your friend, even though that's really hard. But it's doable. And, and there's this tipping po- point, right? Once you engage in resistance, it actually starts melting away. And you realize there's a lot of 
do you know there's a whole world of rich meaning or rich something behind the resistance that's worth exploring mm. yeah and i think first recognizing busyness as resistance is um key a key first step because mm -hmm. in this in this culture it's um you know again it's where we go and it's fine and it's good and it's celebrated in a lot of cases and to develop the awareness around um i'm i'm busy now am i avoiding something and if so what yeah exactly it's really you know if we can acknowledge or if we can even be aware as a first step and then if we can acknowledge that we're identified with being busy right mm -hmm. that's the first step of actually not being a victim to busyness so i was taking a stab at this question myself of what do we mean when we say create space and being in the luxurious position of having two people go before me, I could say, I agree with what you both said. And as I was listening to you both talk at it, I was curious about, are we creating space or are we more accessing the space that's available? And I think what I mean by that is we take ourselves to be, a particular person you know this is who I am this is where I grew up this is my educational background my professional background here's the things that I like and don't like and we start to view ourselves as this more and more fixed personality and when we're in that kind of mode we start to shrink and cut off parts of ourselves so our sense of self is really small so of course we don't feel very spacious so we feel when anything comes at us it feels like it's a lot and we feel as a result that we're overwhelmed and that we're busy because there's all these things to do but as you were saying Catherine, you know just taking that simple practice of if you take a breath one minute breath every hour how we start to reconnect with who we are so then we can so then more and more things can come in because the reservoir is bigger so to speak and so we can hold a lot more of what life brings than we had first anticipated and then we can be doing the same things we can be waking up at the same time doing all of the same tasks but it feels so different because inside we feel so much more calm and spaciousness. And so life feels very different at that point. Yes, it's, it's really an experience that, you know, sometimes when I, when I work with clients uh, early on in, in, you know, in the coaching engagement and they ask me, what does that mean connecting to myself? And, you know, they don't get it, right? Because it's really hard to put language to it. So, so, so I'd encourage, you know, anyone to just play with feeling, you know, feeling what your body feels like, really trying to, to feel more into emotions. And to me, it's really been a gateway to a like visceral or lift experience of what this infinite spaciousness feels like. And, and it's, to me, it feels like ultimate safety. Mm. And when you have that at your core and you can tap into that, you just engage with life very differently. It's, it's, it's very liberating. And <laughs> it's not always easy, you know, it's not like I can just you know, snip my fingers and on demand it's there, right? Like it's very much a journey for me as well. Right. Can you say more about what you found that works for you with your clients in terms of coaching and how your experience, how it shows up, yeah. in, how your experience is, shows up in your coaching and how that affects the groups or teams that you work with and what you're noticing as a result? I mean, it's, it, I really, I don't have a, you know, cookie, cut, cookie cutter kind of way. Like I really work very intuitively with every single client in terms of what I think will work. And some, you know, some of them are way more open than others. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm respecting that. But things that work are even just 
sitting there for a minute, closing your eyes and just listening. Just listen. Just listen to whatever it is you hear. So just one minute of focused attention. You know, that's kind of a, a gateway for me because pe people open their eyes after one minute and they go like, wow. All of a sudden I'm feeling so relaxed or wow, there are so many voices in my head. I can't believe I have all these voices in my head, right? So then you have something to work with. So I'm, I'm trying, you know, I don't want to be like preachy about it. You know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to give people an, a meaningful experience. And a lot of it happens through centering, becoming present to your senses, to your body, um, and not being afraid, you know, creating a safe space where people can be who they are. I think oftentimes we live in a world where we want to be right rather than being real. And I really, in my work, I want to give people a space to be real, mm. both in my one-on-one -on -one work and, and in my work with groups. Mm. Amazing. One last question is that I have is what is right about being busy? So I think ultimately we want to bring our gifts to the world, right? We want to make stuff happen in the world. And I think for me, the most helpful way is to look at it in terms of, a pol of the polarity between doing and being. If we over index on the doing, um, or at least, again, speaking for myself, if I'm over-indexing on the doing and I'm super busy and exhausted and overwhelmed, and, and you know, as I said earlier, th that makes me feel a lack of meaning often. If I over-index on the being, I will probably not survive, right? <laughs> because I need to do something to feed myself and keep myself warm, etc. right? So if I can connect to my being, if I can do the doing for, from a very centered place, then I think that's the space where, where we bring forward wise action in the world, rather than just running around being busy, right? So, so, so that's what I think is right about being busy. It's bringing our gifts, bringing creativity, making stuff happen. You've been listening to Stepping In, the podcast from New Ventures West. Thanks to Joy Reichart and Catherine O'Sullivan for joining me today. We want to hear what you think. Please email us at steppingin at newventureswest.com to share your thoughts. And please share this podcast with your friends on social media. Until next time, I'm Adam Klein. Take care.